Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I let you know that we're now live streaming on YouTube? Welcome to the meeting of the Outer North East Community Committee. My name is Norm, Councillor Norma Harrington, and I'll be chairing today's meeting. The Outer North East Community Committee covers all Woodley, Harewood, and Weatherby wards and is a committee where ward councillors have an opportunity to discuss and make decisions about services and priorities for the local area, and also consider funding applications for local community projects and youth activities. I now invite members and then officers to introduce themselves. Going. Councillor Robinson, can we start with you and we'll work this way, please. Thank you very much for a change. Thank you for changing the batting order, Chair. Yeah, uh, Councillor Matthew Robinson from the Harewood Ward. Councillor Neil Buckley from Old Woodley Ward. Councillor Linda Richards from Weatherby Ward. Councillor Sam Firth from the Harewood Ward. Ryan Stevenson representing the Harewood Ward. Councillor Dan Cowan, now without a biscuit in his mouth, representing the Old Woodley Ward. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair. Localities Officer Preet Matharu. Thank you. Good evening, Toby Russell, Clark to the committee. Hello, um, Tim Sanders, Commissioning Lead for Dementia in the Directorate of Adults and Health. Andy Burbeck, Community Team. Good evening, Catherine Holloway from um, uh, Plans and Policies, City Development. Uh, good evening, Anup Sharma from Planning Policy. Good evening, Joe Volpe, Chief Exec Leads All the People's Forum. Good evening, um, Councillor David Jenkins, and um, represent Killing Beck and Seacroft, but also Older Pearson's Champion. Good evening, Tim Fielding, I'm Deputy Director of Public Health. Thank you, everybody. Right. Can you run through the agenda items one to six, please? Thank you, Chair. Under agenda item number one, there are no appeals against the refusal of inspection of documents. Under item number two, there are no items which require the exclusion of the press or the public. Under item number three, there are no formal late items, but uh, with agreement from the Chair, the minutes of the June meeting have been tabled for ratification. And under agenda item number four, apologies for absence have been received from Councillors Lamb and Councillor Harrand. Under agenda item number five, can I ask members to declare any interests? So that's none. And um, item number six is the open forum, which we've got no submissions for today, Chair. Thank you. Toby, I'm looking at those. Well, not intended, so okay. Okay, so uh, minutes of the previous meeting held on the 20, whatever it was. Of... Yeah, it's 26. And then 26th of June. So are we happy that there are... 27th of June, are we consent that there are true records, please? Yes. Sorry, sorry Chair, we've got the 26th of October as the last meeting, then the 27th have tabled for sort of matters arising just because the meeting wasn't quiet. All right, okay. Okay. 26th of October, sorry. I'll get it right in the end. 26th of October meeting, are we happy with those minutes? Yes. All right. Thank you. And then it was the 27th of June, which was yeah. on the table as well. Okay, and the 27th of June ones, which because we weren't quarters at the beginning of last what, month's meeting, not at the beginning we weren't. Okay, everybody's happy, nobody's saying anything. So matters arising from the minutes of the October meeting. Nope. Okay. Okay, so item number nine on the agenda is the age-friendly lead strategy and action plan for 2022-25. I'm going to invite Tim Fielding, Joe Volpe and Councillor Jenkins to present this item. We just to point out that we obviously have had the papers. <laughs> so it's it's the main points that you really want us to understand. And then we'll ask some questions afterwards. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, yeah, really appreciate this opportunity to come and uh, talk about the strategy and, and the, the refresh strategy and, uh, on this agenda. And I'll just introduce 
it briefly and then I'll hand over to to Joe and to Councillor Jenkins who'll be able to um, pick up in more detail. Really just wanted to emphasise some of those main points um, that, that are highlighted there in the paper uh, about the, 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 the sort of need for this, I guess, in the city. Obviously, one in three people in the city at the moment are uh, age 50 or over and we already see and we know that that's going to increase sharply over the coming years. Uh, Leeds has made that commitment and that ambition to work uh, as part of the, the age-friendly framework through the WHO and the network of, uh, of age-friendly cities and has uh, adopted and the uh, the framework to be fit for purpose for Leeds and has got it as part of the has had a, as part of the best council plan and going forward into the best city plan and got that aspiration and vision about Leeds being a place where people can age well where older people are valued feel respected and appreciated and are seen uh, as the assets they are so I think it is a really positive um, strategy and action plan and, and the infrastructure around it. Uh, do just want to highlight also, which hopefully people are aware of and did see earlier this year, the uh, State of Ageing report in Leeds that was produced uh, in partnership, part of the, the five-year collaboration that we've had between Leeds uh, City Council, the Leeds Elder People's Forum and uh, the Centre for Ageing Better, which was a, the first of its kind in, in terms of that, that kind of approach. And we're going to see, I think, more of those kind of state of the uh, ageing reports coming out across uh, the country as others follow suit. So really wanted to just give you a, a chance and I'll, I'll let Joe pick up uh, a bit more about how the um, this current refresh of the strategy and the action plan has been developed uh, and then obviously be able to, to discuss and uh, take any further questions and can also talk then a bit also about some of the winter preparations, particularly with older people in mind. So uh, thank you, Joe. Hand over to, to Joe. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say that when we were developing the age-friendly lead strategy, we started, as Tim said, by looking at the evidence and what it's like to age in leads. And we collected lots of data and we'd be happy to share a link to that report. And we used, after looking at the data and thinking about the data, our, we then talked to older people about what's important to them when they're aging in the city. And we used that evidence to meet with each of the domain leads. So you'll see from the strategy that there are six different domains in the age friendly lead strategy. There's public and civic spaces, travel road safety, housing, employment and learning, active included and respected, healthy and independent aging. We have digital running across all the themes and communication, uh, trying to communication running across all the themes. So we have a lead person for each of those themes who sits on the Age Friendly Leads board. So that evidence that we gathered with those domain leads, we shared with them and asked them to take an age friendly lens on the work that they were doing so that they could make it think about what it would mean to age when they're developing their strategies and their plans and as such they've put objectives we've got objectives in the plan against each of those domains so that that's how we developed the strategy using the evidence talking to older people working with the domain leads drafting this strategy and action plan and then sharing it quite widely and we've been sharing it widely it is a draft so we will be happy to take any comments but just to introduce you in the report to the work that leads all the people's forum do we offer opportunities for local communities local people to get involved in age-friendly work within their communities themselves so we have an age-friendly um, ambassador program where individuals can sign up and pledge to do things which will make their area more age-friendly or their organisation. So we've had people who've campaigned about um, roads and crossways that aren't working and, and we, we support the ambassadors and we get them together regularly and share information with them. We encourage everybody to become a dementia friend. It's a one hour session with the Alzheimer's Society. It, it just really helps people to get a, an understanding of what it's like to live with dementia or to be a carer of someone living with dementia. We promote um, a scheme called Be an Age and Dementia Friendly Business. I had a look um, with, and 
we've got about I think about 80 businesses signed up uh, I could only find a couple within the outer northeast wards so any opportunities that you could share for us to promote that within businesses in your areas we'd, we'd gladly welcome we have a scheme called come in and rest which we ask businesses to put a sticker in your window show that you are a place that somebody if they set off on the journey to the the local shop and know that they can only get so far down the road but there's a seat and there's somewhere friendly they can go in at no cost to themselves then they can take a rest and then they can go on for the rest of the journey it's just a small piece of kindness that you know businesses can do to just to make life a little bit easier and we have um, an age-friendly steering group at Leeds Older People's Forum. This I call our group of older activists. They're people who like to campaign. We let them set the agenda, but we support them to talk about what's important to them and support them in ways that they can make a change either within the community or within the city as a whole. So that's our age friendly strategy and action plan. I'll just pass back to Tim for the uh, winter resilience. Thank you ever so much. Um, and yeah, just to really emphasise that partnership that we've got with Leeds Older People Forum is absolutely critical and the work that uh, Jo's done both in her role currently as, as Chief Exec, but also previously when she was uh, working through the Centre of Raising Better has been absolutely um, critical to all of this. Um, so that's the strategy itself. Obviously, at this particular point of year, we've got a, a quite a, a substantial response happening across the population around winter pressures. We always have that each year. This year does feel something uh, a bit over and above with all the additional pressures that, we, that we've got happening around the cost of living. So uh, on uh, page 13 of your uh, packet, there's... Um, a section in the report that talks about and summarises some of the work that's happening specifically around older people in relation to winter resilience. So I won't go through that uh, in detail, but it just highlights some of the services that were involved uh, in commissioning and providing uh, through partners some of the information and advice service that we have there through Age UK. Uh, a really key one is the Home Plus Lead service that's uh, run with Care and Repair in partnership with uh, Age UK and also with um, Green Doctor. Uh, and then there's a couple of schemes that we have which provide substantial support across the city in relation to uh, the lunch clubs uh, grants that we issue, large number of those uh, that, that make a real difference, and also the uh, the winter grants. And we've just, in response to the, the particular circumstances this year, we've had additional second rounds of both of those grant schemes as well to really make sure that we're trying to uh, reach as many people as possible this year. Uh, and the last bit, just to highlight, is some of the, the other areas and opportunities for local councillors or other partners that, that uh, can, can get involved and can sign up to uh, otherwise people can get more involved so we've highlighted the cold weather alerts uh, but also some of the opportunities and resources available for people that are working or volunteering uh, with any community groups with older people or anybody else uh, and particularly those that, that are available through uh, the public health resource centre there which is a really good resource uh, for uh, for people in that situation and lastly just highlighting the winter friends um, campaign that we've got and again yeah, you can just google it or it's winterfriends.org where people are able to sign up and find more information uh, about that too. Uh, so uh, lastly just to say in terms of the governance for, for the age-friendly work overall we have uh, an age-friendly board uh, which is chaired by Councillor Jenkins uh, so I don't know uh, Councillor whether you'd uh, like to say anything on that thank you. Uh, thank you Tim. Um, so it's it's important, I think, to recognise that child leads becomes very much um, centred around being child friendly, and for the last ten years, been a child friendly city. Less so, perhaps, as a, an age friendly city. Although that's really what the strategy is trying to address. Also, um, becoming a marmot city means that we're trying to tackle health inequalities. So. It may be that most of the health inequalities are within the inner city areas. So we want to come today really to find out from you what you feel are the, the health inequalities, if you like, in the outer areas, um, which have pockets of um, deprivation as much as anywhere else. So some of the issues that I think we're quite concerned about and um, people have campaigned around is trying to get an, at a national level an older person's commissioner. So there's a children's commissioner. There's 
a mental health commissioner. Um, there's domestic violence and domestic abuse commissioner. Um, we heard today there's actually a commissioner for public toilets, uh, which is uh, quite an, um, an interesting development. But there is work in the House of Lords, I think, to um, where this whole issue of becoming a uh, having a commissioner for older people has been raised. So there's a commissioner in for older people in Wales and in Northern Ireland. Um, some of the other issues that I think we're concerned about, particularly the fuel crisis, the cost of living crisis, um, the effect of COVID on, on older people's mental health, um, the ability to get health checks so that most people can get a health check between the age of about 40 and 74. But it's quite hard to get health checks at the moment because you're hard to get doctor's appointments and so on. So we're trying to get the local care partnerships to improve the access to health partners, uh, to, to health checks, particularly to look at issues around blood pressure and um, cholesterol. So those are issues, those are aspects of person's health that can perhaps be more preventative um, and working with public health as well. So uh, the other concerns that we've had um, is around provision of healthy eating. So we've got a slow cookers project in, in Seacroft, which, um, which I represent. Um, and we've been trying to do a, a pilot there to extend the ability to for people to be able to cook cheaply, but also with healthy healthy ingredients. But primarily, we'd like to hear from you as to what your views are about the strategy and how to improve it. Thank you. Thank you very much to all three of you for that. Uh, any questions, colleagues? Right, so we'll take uh, Councillor Buckley, then Councillor Richards, and then Councillor Firth. Thank you. Uh, thank you for for those uh, remarks and thank you for the report. Um, when you go to um, voluntary uh, third sector organisations, you often find that most of the volunteers are over 70 and they're helping the old folk. And this is a plea really not to uh, not to patronise all old people because uh, I'll come to something else in a minute, but um, we had um, on the Climate Emergency Committee, we had a, a presentation the other day, and it was from um, uh, a chap who was probably about 30, and he was talking about transport. And he said, well, of course, the over 70s need to, um, should be reapplying for the driving licence. Uh, and in fact, he said, they shouldn't really be driving at all. And I asked him to clarify that, and he said, oh, well, I didn't really mean that. I, I, it was a slip of the tongue. Well, he probably did mean it because he's 30. Um, that's a comment. Now, uh, just going on to, uh, as it happens, page 13 of the report, it mentions in the um, first paragraph, uh, in addition, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic can add and pose additional risk to those who are socially vulnerable? Well, not really now, because most people acknowledge, do they not, that if this is not over, it never will be. And my question would be, are we not in danger of causing more worry and distress to people by continuing to mention it than we would if we simply let it drop? In my view, that's essentially over, and it's something that they need not worry about in the future. And then just going on to uh, the final thing, Chairman, if I can, is um, the age of 50 is mentioned in the, in the text of the report. Um, and then 55 is mentioned. 50 and 55 are, are barely even middle-aged. They shouldn't be in here, in my view. Um, I played squash with a chap who's age 72 the other day and he wiped the floor with me. So let's just get this into context. Um, and finally, this is the final, final point, uh, the reference in here to Lee City Council hiring over 50s. Well, that's fine, but how do they know they're over 50? Are they, not, are they allowed to ask them what age they are? Thank you.
Uh, I, I, chair, I, through yourself, Chair, I, I'll kind of really welcome the comments and um, I'll let Joe come back and, and, and pick up some of the bits around, I guess, sort of definitions and, and ages. I mean, I think a couple of the points to pick up, really welcome it. And certainly if there is any suggestion whatsoever of um, anything about this entire approach, uh, seeming to patronise older people, we absolutely need to hear that because that is the absolute opposite of what this intended. And th this is about trying to uh, instil a positive city for everybody. And it isn't just aimed at uh, identifying older people as particularly frail or particularly vulnerable. It's about uh, a city that is healthy and encouraging and, and um, embracing of, of people of all age, including uh, through into older, older age. But it's also about um, addressing stigma as well and really tackling in, uh, any stigma and assumptions and prejudices that there are about older people. So I, I would hope that through this whole programme of work, we, we would be um, addressing some of that. Um, the other bit I'll just uh, mention specifically, I guess, is the is COVID um, point. I absolutely take on board your comments. I think clearly we're in an extremely different position this year than we have fortunately been for the last two years in relation to COVID, a very diff a different situation, fortunately, and we're not facing uh, the same levels of lockdown and sort of single uh, issue challenge that we were uh, over those last two very challenging winters. What, what I would say, however, is COVID hasn't gone away entirely. I completely agree. We don't want to um, single it out in terms of uh, uh, making it a, a factor. I would very much frame it as part of the ongoing um, winter risks or, uh, and uh, reality that we have. So it is still a reality. We do still get it. And I would strongly still encourage people to take the measures around things like vaccination. But I completely take the point that um, we don't need to, to, to single it out over and above uh, a number of the other sort of respiratory diseases and flu. So it's very much those messages about making sure people take sensible precautions and included within that in terms of really encouraging people to get those vaccinations for both flu and for uh, COVID. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Councillor, for raising those points. And, and like Tim said, we absolutely don't want this to appear patronising at Leeds Older People's Forum. We campaign against ageism. So I really welcome the councillor standing up when someone makes an ageist remark and pulling them up for it because we absolutely need to do that. I think, why do we start this at 50, 55, that, that, that age range? Leeds wants to, has an ambition to be the best city to grow old in. And I guess we all start aging as soon as we're born. So it's, we start at 50, because we can still change habits, we can still make things better. And so it's about aging. It's not about just being old, I think would be my response. Right. So if we go to Councillor Richards and Sam, if you, Sam Firth, if you could ask your questions together, then we'll try and group them a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would, uh, as one of the people who is galloping towards old age myself, I was very appreciative of the uh, many varied uh, objective expectations and outcomes that we had there. Um, the thing which struck me about all of this, though, and it is a part, it is a function of the outer northeast, is the fact that I wrote one word on each of the section, and it was buses. Um, the reality is that many of these extraordinarily laudable aims and objectives are just simply not sitting with the bus provision as it is and as it is likely to be. And as a person who is dependent on the buses for about six months of my life when I was on crutches, I know exactly what that means. And therefore, you will not have your choice of transport options. You will not have your... Uh, affordable, accessible to parks or anything else like this, because it simply doesn't go there or it simply goes there once an hour. Um, so my question is, when it says that they are going to complete Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme, I feel that that isn't necessarily the reality of it. And my the link with that would be that whilst on another section, it talks about the vision zero, i.e., you know, limiting the number of people impacted by motor accidents. I wonder if the data would support focusing on something like that at the expense of 
overinvestment, if you might be, in the buses and public transport element, which might actually impact more and um, more greatly. So I'm just wondering whether if there could be um, a prioritisation of that which will actually enable some of these things to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation and also the detail, because I think that certainly um, it is welcome. And I think that's because of the fact that speaking for the Harewood Ward, and uh, David knows this because we've talked about this privately before, is the fact that we are the three youngest councillors on average representing the oldest uh, lo longest living ward in the whole of the city and therefore it's even more prevalent that when it comes to dealing with issues within our wards it is particularly keen that we make sure we are as connected up as possible but we have one key problem that we are effectively 13 main villages strewn across the whole of the outer northeast of the city uh, of which as has been mentioned if bus services are not provided then unfortunately those villages can be totally cut off from services uh, for example the the nature of uh, we have a situation where at the moment we can't take advantage of the of the East Leeds flexibus, which a lot of our residents, in particular in Barrick Skulls, Aberford, are particularly perturbed about, uh, and the simple fact that you can't get a bus from the latter, from Aberford to Garforth, despite the fact that having lost our recent uh, surgery, the Jessamine Cottage, they can't get to that particular surgery, so they have to go to Barrick instead. And that's the crucial point here, is the interesting point about our particular ward is the geography of it, because a lot of the areas within it uh, feel very connected to areas that aren't within it, be it Weatherby, be it Crossgates, be it Garforth. And as a result, it makes it even more difficult when it comes to allocating services. So we do have some great work that's taken place, particularly around Weatherby and the Weatherby Ward in Wise, um, but also we have got some good voluntary groups, in particular in, in Thorner, Shadwell and Skulls. It's two, three very good examples. Uh, and I think the biggest thing for us is trying to make sure, and what we're trying to do as councillors is ensure that that COVID anxiety that many have had is absolutely we throw it out the window as soon as we can and get people out and enjoying the latter years of their life as much as possible. But it is absolutely critical that because of the fact that they are 13 effectively silos, we very much have a difficulty of a lot of people doing a very good job, but potentially working separately from each other when a bit more cohesive working could really help to deliver greater change across the area, just a stone's throw from where a lot more activity is happening in the more urban fringe. Thank you. I think, Liza, you see, you'll see that those were comments for you to take back rather than questions. So uh, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Cohen and then Councillor Robinson. Thank you, uh, Chair. I have two questions. Um, first of all, uh, we mentioned, well, Councillor Buckley rightly mentioned that sort of third sector activity um, and declaring an interest. I am already a dementia friend. Um, I have noticed after the pandemic, a lot of those organisations, your sort of little uh, memory cafes and things that happen in the community that aren't part of a neighbourhood network have almost diminished because the people who were active uh, in those and organising them, who were mostly over 70, um, have either taken the opportunity to, to stop at that point but there was no obvious person to hand over to, and it's just they've not started again. Yeah. So in terms of um, capacity building, how much resource is being given either to existing neighbourhood networks to expand or, for example, through community committees um, yeah. Yeah. to help those uh, third sector organisations come back? Because actually um, they were doing a huge amount for to combat social isolation and just actually uh from my experience i used to go on a on a saturday morning it was at sometimes less for the people who actually had dementia for example but for their carers to share information uh, and just talk about experiences with others uh, and have a break so capacity to rebuild is the first question and then secondly just on the back of councillor jenkins comments uh regarding um cost of living etc um of course pensioners in general are, are receiving quite a lot of state support in terms of additional payments this year 
uh, winter fuel allowance, etc. Um, one of the facts that alarmed me the other day that actually there's a significant number of people who are entitled to pension credit who don't claim it. Mm. Um, and I think the deadline is the 18th of December in which to uh, apply for that. And if you do, you get an additional £324 payment. But if you're on pension credit, it's actually worth an extra £3,300. So in all of the resources we're spending as a council in order to try and do get information out, et cetera, um, how much time are we actually giving to ensure that those people who should be getting pension credit are getting it? Because that would be a cost-effective use of time, I would suggest, other than, uh, than doing everything else. Councillor Cohen, do you want to ask your question now? It's a mixture of a question and a comment, Chair. Thank you. Um, really, to start with picking up a point, I suppose, uh, that, that Councillor Buckley alluded to, and I think it's really, really important um, be because this strategy and report seems to start to pick up at, at 50. Uh, now, perhaps that's a sensitivity I have, having just turned uh, 50. It's a, it's, a, it's a financier by the name of Bernard Baruch, uh, who, who used to say that old age is always 15 years older than me. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I appreciate that we, we have to set a benchmark. But equally, over my 50 years, I have noticed that, uh, that people who were considered old 50 years ago, 40 years ago, are, are but regarded as spring chickens now. Um, we have a best city plan that seeks to ensure that Leeds is the best city to live in. Uh, uh, and therefore, if we're having an older person strategy, then for me, for it to be meaningful, it really needs to be focusing on people who the person in the street would genuinely regard as an older person. And I take your point that we're, we're getting old from the moment we're born, but that's somewhat, but you know, we don't, we don't have a 30 strategy in a four. We have a really important, the principle behind this is laudable, but it loses its impact because it's far too wide. The needs, and I appreciate it will be a matter of scaling, but to suggest that those who are 50, 51, 52 should be included in a strategy aimed at tackling and assisting those of 91, 92, 93 is frankly nonsensical. So I would need some real persuading as to why, for example, if the NHS regards somebody 65 and over as an older person, why we're coming in 15 years younger, because once we do this, we're committing resource. And every time I speak to officers, I'm being told how precious every penny is and yet we seem to be spending 15 years worth of resource, not to maximum impact. Um, so I, I really strongly, strongly feel that this is starting too early. And in starting too early actually undermines so much that is really positive within it. Um, I, I'm really pleased you agreed with the point Councillor Buckley made about uh, winter illnesses rather than COVID. Um, again, healthcare is absolutely, and I say this as someone involved as a vaccinator, healthcare is absolutely recognising that flu is certainly a significant, I don't want to say more significant, but a significant risk for elderly people. Uh, and the vaccine programme is as obsessed with trying to make sure that people get their flu jab as their COVID jabs. Um, and, and I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and I encourage those that haven't got uh, either to get both as soon as possible. Um, 
but Councillor Richards also made a hugely important point because the outer areas of our city have poor accessibility. Uh, I get emails every day, phone calls every day by residents telling me that the bus service to all Woodley and beyond is just outrageous. It just doesn't exist. And what's the point having a strategy that talks about accessibility to services when the only, you can't get those services because the public transport isn't there? So what's the default? So we use the private motor car. But of course, the city's strategy is to stop people being able to access our city centre with a motor car. Which is why if you live in the outer areas, frankly, you can go to Harrogate if you want a major city. So, so, you know, if that's part of our lead strategy, if you want to access services, go to Harrogate where they'll welcome you with open arms, give you free parking for two hours in the city centre, merely by having a disc. Um, well, then we should say that in letters on, of black and white and words of one syllable, but I don't think that is what we're trying to say. So I think there's huge amounts in here that are laudable, but I think we are at conflict with ourselves and I think we're starting too early. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Robinson, do you want to make your point and then at least they can make a note of all of them? Yeah, sure. I'm very happy to do that, Chair. Uh, yeah, similar to Councillor Cohen, I, know, I was thinking of my own family as we go through this, and I'm the only one that doesn't have a strategy now. Um, so I, I'm feeling a little left out. I'm presuming there's going to be a middle-aged white man strategy coming forward anytime soon. Um, but on the point made about buses, yeah, absolutely, there's... Um, there's a problem connecting people and it's not just connecting people uh, in general, it's connecting people to facilities they need, particularly older people to facilities they need, such as GP surgeries, such as hospitals and healthcare facilities. In a similar way, now that taxis are back running in a fairly normal post-COVID way, um, we're in a situation in many areas of the outer northeast where a, you, a taxi won't necessarily come and get you. Um, and take you into town we don't actually have a, a tax service so not only do we have to rely on the pub on the individual owning a car um but even if they wanted to take another option those avenues have been closed down to them as well so that there's a, a real challenge there similarly this report is and, and it is laudable and it's something that I, I do welcome there's nothing about that bit of interim care so where people are going into hospitals they're coming out of hospitals but not ready to be into their own home it doesn't we're not necessarily signposting people to that i don't think through the report or, or acknowledging that there's a huge crop of people there who will need that sort of support and um and joe's searching through quickly so i'm sure she'll correct me in a moment if i'm wrong or i've missed it but i, I think that that thing about starting too early we need to know who we're aiming for maybe breaking down the objectives a, a little bit more might help in doing that the, the final thing and that I'd ask is um, Tim talked about the digital underpinning of all of this. Ultimately, in many ways, when a bank closes its branch, there isn't a bank that's coming back to town. That service isn't going to be there anymore. If we don't have people that have the right digital skills and digital uh, infrastructure in place so that they can get online and know how to use it, not only will they not be able to work if they're post 50 um in the workplace but they won't be able to get on do online banking they won't be able to access a prescription they won't be able to book a doctor's appointment they won't be able to know when the bus is if they're running uh, uh, run, uh what the timetable is going to be in their area digital scene is underpinning this but i'm not aware of what exactly is being done for people in the outer northeast who maybe need to improve their digital skills where they would be signposted to and how much funding is available and what options are available for them to access that because some of these other resources that's bigger it's bigger than you and talking about buses bigger than i but actually other more meaningful community projects are what we need to signpost people to thanks chair thank you uh, tim i think uh, councillor cohen's health question is does require a response i think some of the other things are comments that you need to make a note of for the strategy um, and i think councillor buckley's got a final question 
<clears throat> yeah, it, it was just a, a couple of comments, really. Uh, page 13 of the report um, mentions the, the bus strategy, uh, which Councillor Richards has mentioned, um, and Councillor Robinson, and the walking and cycling uh, strategy. Well, as far as uh, old people, as mentioned in the report, are concerned, they're completely in conflict because there may be a bus strategy, but there are no buses. And none of them want the walking and cycling strategy. I can tell you that I would say in the outer northeast, 10% of the population would vote for the walking and cycling strategy because they've never had the opportunity to vote for it or vote against it. It's completely irrelevant and costly, and it does damage because, as has been mentioned, they can't get into town one way or another, um, and so on. Um, and, and final uh, point is don't give us a commissioner. Another person with a secretary, an office, a policy, a strategy, cost another 10 million a year. No, please. Okay, Tim, do you want to answer the healthcare question, please? Uh, yeah, Chair, can I just clarify the, the specific question? Because I, I have a few points to, to come back in that, but just, just so I can be clear, I'm answering the, the specific question if, the, about healthcare and all. Councillor Cohen. That, thanks, Chair. Now, it, it was more around the, the definition. I, I was the, the NHS, when they're talking of older people, start they specifically, NHS policies, we define an older person as 65 and over. Uh, and we try to do so much joined up thinking with our NHS partners. I'm just curious to know why we've gone out on a limb and decided I'm old. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, thanks, Chair. And I'll, I'll try to address that that point. And, and I think it, I completely uh, understand and appreciate some of the confusion and um, some of the sentiments around where where some of that cutoff has been used and uh, others who've been involved in this might have other further comments i mean my understanding of, of the rationale for that is the, the nhs age of 65 and that in itself is fairly arbitrary we know that actually 65 is is in itself uh, uh, you know uh, fairly arbitrary when it comes to to aging this is a much more preventative focused uh, uh, approach rather than that. So, so I think there are, as you say, a number of definitions. I think it is something that we do need to take away and have a look at to be much clearer in the language about uh, where we're talking about the phases of life where people are, uh, where, where we're talking about the very preventative element, i.e. that sort of 50 to 65 and 50 upwards, where it's very preventative versus where we're actually defining people as uh, older people, potentially, where I think, uh, Councillor Cohen, you, you, you're right, we probably need to be more consistent there with uh, other more widely recognised definitions and, for example, those those that are used in the NHS. Um, what I would say is I think there is something really important about that, that uh, preventative bit about ageing and about trying to have um, give that thought to, to places. The, the other bit I'd, I would just add is... This is not about um, care, and I think this picks up on one of the, uh, the, the other questions, which was about the care, and it's a really valid point. This is very much about uh, the environment that people live in and about that that preventative bit, the, the, the wider determinants, if you like, and, and people's social bit. This is complementary to the health and care plans that there are. And uh, within the directorate that I work in, Adult Health and Care, there is uh, the Better Lives strategy, which is just in the, in the process of being developed and um uh, produced that is very much aimed at those people who require care and support and particularly older people that require care and support so there's a very particular bit and again we may just need to make sure we make a much more explicit cross-reference between the two about how the two complement each other because they both have a very clear purpose but they do absolutely complement each other in that so, so I think that that's a uh, really helpful uh, comment and, and feedback. Um, the only other thing I'd just say about uh, the, the ageing is if we look at the sort of areas that are covered within this in terms of um, travel on some of those road safety, some of the, the, the being active, particularly around some of the employment and the learning, some of the stigma that's applied, some of the barriers that people may experience around some of those things will start to happen to people uh, at a relatively early, young, uh, young, older age, I would say. And so I think we will find that people do report some elements of stigma around uh, employment and learning and, and access issues. And so I think it's a difficult one to balance. The final point is 
actually, when we come to look at life expectancy is one thing, but when we look at healthy life expectancy, it tells us another picture altogether. Our healthy life expectancy for Leeds, uh, officially for men, is 61. Um, so actually, uh, although people may be uh, living and we're significantly lower than the national average, and we know that there's a hugely sharp social gradient on that. So we'll have significant swathes of the city where people are actually uh, self-reporting and considering in um, unfit, basically, and unwell from uh, it, from their, their mid-50s on average in some areas up to uh, probably uh, late 60s and into the 70s. So a lot of those quite physical and mobility issues that will affect older people will also be starting to affect people because of those uh, conditions that we know will, will be affecting the health. But I, I do absolutely take on board the point, and I think we'll we'll take that back and, and reflect on that. Um, just on the buses, I mean, that's come out absolutely loud and clear. I couldn't, couldn't you know, clearly don't need to uh, emphasise how, how loud that, that's come across. I, I think it's something we can certainly take back and see how specific we're being and maybe reflect within the the a trendy board about the role that the board is playing in in specifically advocating uh, around that issue one thing i did just want to draw people's attention to i mentioned the state of aging report i really really uh, encourage people to have a look i mean i've just uh, pulled it up just to, to to check the the chapter that's in there on transport literally starts the first page highlights in bold the first quote on it the older we get the more likely we are to take the bus and it highlights right from the off in that chapter both the 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 increasing reliant the increasing use of and the increasing reliance on buses uh, in older people that increases up from from that age up it also um highlights the uh, the issues and the, the rurality issues and also highlights uh for people aged 65 and over the um uh, range of car uh, ownership across the city. So really trying to draw out and, and, and spotlight those um, uh, th those issues. So they are very much captured, but we do need to take that back and make sure that we're actually reflecting that in the, in both the action plan and, and the work that the board's doing. So I'll um, pass over. I don't know if uh, Joe wants to pick up. I would have said what Tim said around the um, healthy life expectancy, the employment, um, the, nothing else to add on that leads all the people's forum here all the time from um our membership organizations and from all the people the issues that they have with transport we've got a travel connections program where we're highlighting issues around loneliness effect that that's as a result of transport and we're taking collecting evidence and and we would want to have conversations with the combined authority about that so you know, absolutely hearing that. And and as Tim said, we need to see if we can, can focus. Definitely would um, advocate for promoting pension credit. I've worked in the aging sector for almost, I don't know, 15, 20 years, and it's a constant, constant issue. We've probably got about 35% of people that don't claim that could. And even if they don't get a payment, it, into the god to get a small payment because it's savings credit it will be a gateway to other benefits thank you very much and um, councillor firth you have one tiny question and councillor robinson also has a very brief question i was just going to ask already what sort of role does leads old people's forum already play in terms of the work they already do with WICA and also across the board trying to improve services and the reason i say that is i appreciate across the whole of the city buses are a problem but the biggest problem we have is that buses are the only option in our area whereas other areas close by garforth crossgates uh, and other areas have multiple buses uh, unfortunately that also connect and trains that connect up to our area so is there anything you could add to that I'll be brief as well. Um, in light of comments that are made from uh, councillors and also your own comments, presumably the bus companies and the taxi companies will be signed up as age friendly businesses um, on the back of tonight and you'll approach them. Councillor Cohen, you want to come back? I'll be really, really quick. And in fact, I don't think I even want an answer now, but something. Um, just in relation to the employment piece, um, I'd be fascinated to know how we're going to ensure that this approach is compatible with duties under the Equality Act 
that prohibits positive discrimination on the basis of age. So I'd be, I'd, I'm not looking for an answer now, but at some point I would like an answer because as an employment lawyer, I know it's a particularly challenging area. Um, and if you have a workaround, that'd be really helpful, actually. <laughs> Thank you um, to Tim and Joe and um, Councillor Jenkins for, for that input and for the report. Uh, we we realise that it will have taken an awful lot of time to actually pull it together. So we hope that the comments are helpful um, because we've recognised that it is a draft report. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks all. So moving on to agenda item number 10 now is Adults and Health Leads Dementia Strategy, um, and that's Tim. And I think there might be one or two questions that people were thinking of earlier that may well come up um, in your session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm just um, sorting out screen sharing. So I've um, I've um, brought a presentation ra rather than a report, but I think the aims are similar to to fly the flag for dementia, um, to to promote the local strategy, and just to seek out your local community knowledge of of the gaps and opportunities we might have to um, to advance the cause and and, and um, Im Im improve support for people. Um, my role is a is a joint one with the NHS, so I'm, um, it's quite a, quite a privilege just to have this focus on dementia and to play this role across across the council and NHS. So, so there's um, elements of this that might be more health focused around diagnosis, and elements that might be more um, community and, and 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 social care focused. And the aim of the the joint role is 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 to join those things up. Um, I think. Um, just for a bit of background about dementia as a condition, which I apologise will be sort of old, old hat to a few people, but just to make sure we're sort of starting from a, a common point. Um, it's mostly identified with memory loss, but it's not just about memory. There can be other other symptoms, other signs, um, because there's a lot of diversity of types of dementia and the, and the impact it, it has on people. So things around confusion and communication. Um, it's caused by organic brain diseases. So in the same way as you can get kidney failure or heart failure, we can get um, physical health conditions that, that that affect the brain. And, and it's a different thing to the normal, the normal run of age related forgetfulness. So going upstairs and forgetting what you went upstairs for is, is, is normal as we go through middle, middle and older age, um, hard, harder to multitask. Um, but and 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 that's not dementia. It's a long-term and progressive condition, so it's something we live with. It's not something we can cure at the moment. There are some tablets that have a um, that that can slow the progress for some people with Alzheimer's disease. There's no treatments for other other types of dementia. Um, time, timely diagnosis helps. We used to talk about early diagnosis, but I prefer the word timely because it's. It means we're not ambushing people and forcing them, pushing them to the doctor before they're ready. It takes time to come to terms with these with, with these things. But, but but one of the important messages is if, if you're worried, make an appointment at, at your GP practice or, or nudge the person as best you can. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more later on about um, services that can um, that can help with that. Um, We've had a national we had a national dementia strategy for the first time back in 2009 and and the post I'm, I, I hold now was created in the wake of that strategy. Um, after that strategy ran out, we had two consecutive um, prime ministers challenges on dementia and um, it's it's notable at, at the moment with everything else that's that that's been going on nationally politically. Um, we don't have a national strategy for dementia at the moment and I I, I think that makes it all the more important to have a local strategy, um, particularly as, as we find, you know, as, as we're coming into winter, we find people with dementia disproportionately occupying hosp hospital beds, um, um, at risk of staying longer, at greater risk of, di of being stuck in hospital for lack of out of hospital destinations, disproportionate risk of, of dying in hospital, which isn't really where anyone 
ne necessarily would you know would, cho would choose as a, as a as a place of death so I, I've, I've just given the Alzheimer's Society website as a as a reference there um the um so the Leeds Dementia Strategy has got lots of Leeds numbers in it so for the purposes of this meeting I've I've been in touch with public health intelligence colleagues and got some local numbers so that's going back um nearly four years now and it it shows the general pattern that we were getting better at identifying and finding and diagnosing people um really in the in the in the decade before the pandemic those those numbers were on on, on an upward trend and uh, um steeper than any trend of population prevalence of dementia we were getting better at um at diagnosis um and the drop in dementia diagnosis was one one way in which the pandemic um was very tough for people living with dementia and carers so you can see from 2020 to 2021 um the numbers dropped and and a year on we we were starting to recover again and and we're back up um for Leeds as a whole we're, we're back up to the um diagnosing roughly two-thirds of the estimated prevalence at, of, of dementia which is the sort of ambition set by NHS England we've recovered to that extent but we haven't recovered to where we were before the pandemic so um we're still missing opportunities to identify people and 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 um and and and, and intervene early um just carrying on with with the facts and figures um roughly 85 percent of people with dementia have have a carer by which i mean un, unpaid person usually family very very often spouse but not always um and the further you go along with the progress of dementia the more likely you are to have someone supporting you um so that would mean for almost for almost 500 carers in this community committee area um of whom one third are, are economically active so maybe 160 people across your three wards um caring for someone with dementia and trying to hold down a job at the same time you can see the importance of of carer break services wider family support day services and so on um and one thing that really strikes me with the facts and figures is that um 12 percent of people have a class of as having severe dementia um and um but even when you get to the point of having severe dementia you've only got a roughly 50 50 chance of having moved into a care home so that means 50 percent of those people in those later stages where the symptoms include things like being disorientated today and night, um, continence difficulties, mobility difficulties, um, psychological distress and the behaviours that, that go with it. You've still got 50% of people with those kinds of symptoms still still living at home with uh, un, unpaid and sometimes with with, with, um, with with paid support. So it's a relatively small number of people, but if you're looking for the sort of people at the wrong end of health inequalities in a in a, in a in a in an older and relatively perhaps re relatively affluent affluent position those those could be the people you start to you, know, you, you start to think about and and maybe a further 70 people who might not be classed with with severe dementia but according to our local nhs data will will have severe severe frailty so we're talking about dementia combined with other health conditions that you know travel together because of because of older age and I've just put this, some of those sources there so our, our local strategy went through the council exec board in um autumn 2020 and through the health and well-being board and it was very much um co-produced by our Leeds dementia partnership and one of the signs of producing a strategy across a wide partnership is you end up with a lot of priorities because um every everyone's got their own perspective um so so we identified 13 building blocks talking about leads leads aspiration to be the best the best place to live with um the best city if you like including the towns and villages um the best the best place to live with dementia and so those 13 building blocks uh are identified as the things that have to be in place if, if we want leads to be um to be the best or the, or, the, or, the, or the best that we can be um so we, we've talked about dementia friendly leads already I've, I've talked about timely diagnosis and support um 
we've talked um I, th I think in the strategy where it talks about diversity there are a few lines about the sort of rural, rural urban diversity as well as other ways in, in, in which we think about diversity in the council um those timely transfers of care and, and maybe more surprising things like opportunities for arts and creativity which um are all re really good things for our for our brains and as as dementia progresses and we might lose some of our spoken language and verbal ability th things like music and art can become um can be become more important um we can't have 13 priorities so in the top right hand corner we've identified six and i've put a link to the full strategy where we've got it on the on, on the council website so these are the these are the things i propose just touching on for the rest of the presentation um reducing our risks and this links to the idea that um thinking about old age starts before we're old or very old um sorry i've just real um i think i've just lost the slide somewhere but th this is the first of the things i wanted to talk about um these risk factors are probably a surprise to nobody they're all the things they're all related to things we enjoy doing and and unfortunately are, are bad for us and the general message is that if it's if it's good for the heart it's going to be good for the brain if it reduces the risk of cancer it's probably also going to um reduce reduce the risk of dementia but there are also um some social factors as well um people tend to think of things like crosswords and sudoku puzzles as being the things that are good for the brain but actually where human beings are social creatures and um social interaction and language uses up a much higher proportion of our brain cells than um than doing a crossword crossword puzzle does social contact is important education even particularly up to the age of 18 the evidence is that that's protective against dementia because it's the it's the rich connections between the brain cells that even if you then get a a disease process later in life you've built up more capacity and and resilience um correcting hearing loss in midlife and this is where maybe starting at age 50 is a is a is a relevant thing that if the evidence is that if um if um if you're losing your hearing in midlife but you take prompt action to correct it and you're not too proud or too stigmatized to get a hearing aid it it, it helps protect ourselves against dementia same for air quality we we know it's air quality is important for respiratory health but it's you know lots of evidence that it's important for for brain health as well and that, and that's all published in a, a a report by the in the in the lancet journal oh this is this is the slide that was meant to be meant meant to be before so those are the five things i'm touching on one of them I, i've already touched on so i apologize um so we talked about Asian dementia friendly communities as well. Um, that's a picture, I think, from St. Joseph's um, St. Joseph's Church at Weatherby of um from a from from, from a, a, de a dementia friends, a, a dementia friend session. And I sometimes think that we undersell ourselves talking about age friendly, dementia friendly, because it sounds very soft and fluffy sometimes being being friendly. Um, but if if we think of what it's like to be cast out socially what it's like to be not, to be not included and not welcomed and not seen as part of part of the wider world i think that gives an idea of the the power of stigma to really hurt people and really um um damage damage our, our health and well-being um so as, as well as being dementia friendly I, I like to think about having a people having the right to be included having a, a rights-based approach as well as a, a sort of friendship-based approach if if you like um and these older people's forum um have an extra bit of grant funding from the from the council to employ a a, de a, a dementia dementia friendly worker and we get a re really good value for that we get a lot of um like councillor stevenson you were talking about the kind of memory cafe some of which are purely voluntary run on a on a, on a dementia friendly basis um we have um all the um yeah the major sports clubs in Leeds the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation Leeds United Foundation um and 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 these rugby all run monthly sporting reminiscence groups some of which include things things like walking football um include include physical activity as well it's it's about that life beyond health and care that means that the world isn't closing in on you and you're not you're not feeling confined if you get dementia 
um, a diagnosis of dementia puts it puts you on the cusp of a lot of people feel ashamed and withdraw from with start withdrawing from life because they're worried about what people will 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 think and actually it's the worst thing you can do for your health it's the thing that will send send us downhill the quickest with with um with dementia so it's important to be able to talk about it just to be able to say i i i'm worried about my memory i've i've noticed i'm developing problems is it is a really hard thing to do but dementia friendly communities can 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 make it easier um but there's a small number of there's a couple of services i think from the alzheimer society and carers leads that if you know about those two services you will know about um um it, it'll be a gateway to, to to all the others so the alzheimer society has 13 memory support workers um in, including one covering the um weatherby area and they're linked to the nhs neighborhood teams and, and gp practices and carers leads has a um um, a dementia specific carer support team within it about, about um there's about 75 to 80,000 carers in Leeds at the moment and um um the the census data when it's published will give us a, a, an up-to-date count but about one in ten of those carers will be caring for someone with dementia um and, and the important thing to say about those services and I've got some sort of information details coming up is is you don't have to have a diagnosis to access them so if you're if you're a family member worried about someone who who's in denial about about memory problems you can ring carers leads and have that conversation you don't you don't have to have the diagnosis before you can get that kind of help and the same same with the memory support workers um so i've just got a few slides here about about what the memory support workers do um they're employed by the Alzheimer's Society under contract to the to the to the NHS, um, which means that if if they encounter somebody who has a difficulty that needs a clinical intervention rather than just a support worker, they've got a an easy route um, without having to jump through more referral hoops. They can go back to their NHS team and have the, have the conversation, and they're an ongoing point of contact and. Um, you don't have to have your GP to refer. Any, anyone can pick the phone up and make a referral to that um, to that to that service. And the National Alzheimer's Society helpline can connect into it as well. Has the benefit of being open evenings and weekends. And those are just the details for the for for the carers leads team as well. Um, and uh, we've highlighted the importance of of the third sector and, and community groups. Um, already and on that slide like like as as um you were saying earlier count um councillor stevenson there's there's that mix of um um a dementia inclusive business home instead being a home care company that's got sort of got a community aspect to it shadwell community library who who, who purely voluntarily run a um a, a memory cafe and the three neighborhood networks in the community committee area who will do, do, do a lot of very good work and my wish would be for every neighborhood network to um be able to replicate what what Maycare does because of partly because they they've managed to get some extra nhs funding on top of the um the the, the standard neighborhood network funding so they have um they have a service called circles of support which helps people to put together a plan for how they're going to spend their days and spend their weeks and they run a, a, a cognitive stimulation therapy group which um is an offer to people in the mild to moderate stages of dementia which is is evidence-based it's recommended by the national institute for clinical excellence as the only non the only recommended non-drug therapy for for dementia to keep keep people in the mild to moderate stages for longer and strengthen the community so that the community can um support people for longer so that that would be a strategy ambition for me to for people to be able to um for that offer to be um all, all across the Leeds city council area um the other way in which the pandemic impacted really badly for people with dementia as well as the diagnosis rate taking it taking a nosedive was that isolation and, and, and the impact of those those lockdowns I mean I, I was um I was pleased that Leeds City Council were among the first um, first of any organisation to call for people in care homes to have to have at least one named visitor who could 
who would have to comply with the same rules of staff of staff around donning PPE and and follow the same rules. But but to say that um, it, I, I felt it was appalling that care homes were well, they were told to shut out family members, and 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 some of them were more keen than others to take um, to do that. But at the same time, we're happy to have agency staff coming and going, sometimes working across more than one care home. Um, and there seemed to be a view at the height of the pandemic that having a pay slip somehow gave you immunity from COVID and meant you wouldn't pass it on, where, whereas family members were shut out. And that is still Apache. It's it's um it's still not a consistent thing that we have with um, um care homes across the country and in Leeds. I think Leeds does best than others. But, Partly because of the excellent work that Health Watch did, did in Leeds around um, around around family contact, but the um, yeah the impact on people with dementia of not seeing families, not being visited in care homes, you know, we we are still coming back from that. And one thing Leeds Older People's Forum are doing for us is an is an audit of those community groups. So so I'll I'll, I'll have a report in it, um, early in the new new year saying this this is what we had. Um, early in 2020 and this is what this is what's this is what we've got now these these are the groups that have um these are the groups that have struggled and 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 the volunteers have disappeared these are the groups that have come back stronger um it's the opposite it's the opposite side of the area area to yours but the um the methodist church in Driglington before the pandemic had a monthly memory cafe run by run by volunteers and it's now got a weekly memory cafe run by volunteers and actually it was the first to reopen after the pandemic because sometimes it's the volunteer-led groups that have a, a bit more sense of freedom to get up and go for it um so yes i i would like to discuss where we have the gaps and the opportunities and, and the enthusiasms if there's time or by, by email if we're running out of time by the time i've finished i want to say a bit about um dementia and um dementia and frailty because it is an op it is an opportunity if you're involved with lo the local care partnerships and some of the NHS net um, networks in Leeds. There, there is this strong overlap between um, between them, um, people living with dementia and living with frailty, which which isn't surprising given that age is the main risk factor for for both. Um, and just a word about um, about the quality of care and care provision, because the um, even before the pandemic, we had difficulties with staff recruitment, staff turnover. There were care providers where as soon as they um, trained somebody in dementia, they, um, they'd they be off somewhere else and they'd have to have to do it again. We have strengthened the Leeds City Council offer with our, with our care quality team, um, our organisational development team. We've got a programme called Steps Into Care, which aims to take people from the younger population of Leeds, where there might be a gap in educational attainment, but but to put to recruit people on the basis of having the right values and attitudes, to put the training in, and and as a as a pathway to recruitment into in, into care providers, and we have got some specialist dementia care developments both in the independent sector and and within the council's direct care delivery, which are giving us more options to to support people out of hospital. Um, so yeah, I, I've I've put a few ideas for comments and questions, but I know you're not, you're not going to be constrained by those. Local knowledge and community needs is in, it would be of interest. We've already talked about rurality and the risks of isolation, opportunities for dementia friendly initiatives, and 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 and, and, um, and I know that care quality and getting out of hospital is coming up in a lot of conversations at the moment. I will I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I think it would be particularly helpful if you can actually um, send your slide information to Toby or Tree. Oh, you've already done it, right? Okay. Um, then at least we, we've got that to look back on because there were an awful lot of um, links there to various organisations. As a trustee for one of the 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 uh, third sector organisations that were mentioned earlier on, and we're very well aware of Maycare and the other groups within our area because we had a lot of contact with them during the pandemic situation. Uh, we did an awful lot of work in joining up the, the facilities that were still going on by telephone contact, et cetera. And, and WISE were the hub 
that were engaged by Leeds City Council to, to take the forefront in that particular piece of work. So I think as a, as a group of councillors, we're quite well versed in most of those the most of those things. I think we've spoken about the rurality of the area of the outer northeast area. And yes, it is an issue. Again, transport will be a major issue of actually getting people to activities, etc. Um, and some of the groups actually run transport schemes, but volunteers, again, are quite difficult. Um, dementia friendly initiatives, certainly within Weatherby, there are many dementia friendly trainers and most of the organizations would deliver to businesses in the town so there is a, there's quite a an awareness within our area i feel certainly in, in the weatherby ward anyway uh, other colleagues might have a, a different view on some of the other areas um, but that's certainly something that we're we're well versed in um, care quality and leaving hospital that's an ongoing issue and i don't think we're ever going to get anywhere with that this evening um i think councillor firth had a question which he probably wanted to ask at the previous session but linked more into dementia so would you you've got a question sam Thank you for that presentation because it was um, it certainly hit home with some uh, personal experiences and stimulation is absolutely critical with any neurological disease and that even when somebody has got dementia they are still them and they still exist and so I really appreciate that as well and also the comments about discharge services because that is the biggest strain on the nhs at the moment in terms of particular issues that we're facing um i just want to ask you mentioned particularly about um the dementia diagnosis in our area and the estimates around that i just want to ask well, how does that compare to the rest of the city i mentioned earlier we have the oldest average age and life expectancy in the harewood ward for example how does the outer northeast compare to other parts of the city in terms of the spread of dementia um the um if if you um compare the the absolute numbers for head of population um and i and i don't have the exact figures to hand but, but when i've looked at comparisons in the in the past um the outer northeast would have the the highest numbers per sort of head of ad adult population if you um if you do what public health colleagues would call an age standardized rate the picture flip flips over so um if you're a 75 year old um in the outer northeast because it's a more affluent area your risk of having dementia is lower than if you're a 75 year old in, in, in one of the in one of the more deprived areas so yeah higher higher absolute number but a, a lower age standardized risk if you um if you like the um the actual dementia diagnosis rate um i'm not sure if it's if it's valid to to compare different areas for for that reason because the the estimate of dementia prevalence that nhs england uses is very much one size fits all and they are meant to be and, and, and there is research in progress on 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 how the prevalence of things like diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease um and 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 and, and health inequalities would um would impact on prevalence so if, if you look at the diagnosis rate for the for the gp practices in weatherby it looks lower but i i don't think that's because they were i don't, I don't think that's because those gp practices are, are, are any worse at identifying and finding people i know some that are very very good at what they do um um but i th i think it's because um generally the population is healthier so we're overestimating sometimes over overestimating the prevalence so um yeah it's 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 hard to it's hard to tell it's hard to tell exactly um and i'm 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 quite happy to um i'm quite happy to produce figures for for specific wards or I, um nhs digital publishes monthly the figures at, at gp practice level i'm happy to um help 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 with navigation to those but um um i think it's those specific challenges are around social isol social isolation and staying connected when you're at risk of dementia or, or or when you already have dementia that are the things to focus on rather than the rather than the, the numbers Thank you, Tim. Um, uh, did you have a follow-up? 
Thank you, Tim. Uh, no, uh, the reason I wanted to, to look at that is simply because when we draw a, a line and say this is the outer northeast, as I said earlier, the problem is that a lot of our areas, I'm sure you know, tap into areas that are not within that particular area or are over a border. And I think that's the biggest thing that we have in a particular concern in our ward where, for example, the, the local care partnership crosses boundaries. We have part of Crossgates LCP in our patch. Uh, and it means that also certain people have different services all over the place. And that's where I think that it would really help. And, and it was only trying to then draw a wider picture i'll make it into a comment rather than a question um about the fact of trying to say actually how we can then look at how we can get those groups more involved with certain organizations cross-border rather than defining it by each committee area etc it was trying to think how we could look across the piece thank you councillor stevenson and then councillor buckley thank you um, yeah, thank you. As politicians, we hate yes or no questions. So I'm going to give you a, a simple yes or no question. Is every employer, employee in Lee City Council a dementia friend? No, they're not. Why not? Um, we've done that a, a lot of work over the years to have champions within within different teams. And I'm always happy when I come across a colleague who's come from another directorate and turns out to have had a, a dementia friends um, session session there. Um, I think I, I, I'll, I'll take your question as a timely reminder to to um, what's the word renew and uh, um, renew and reinvigorate the the, the, the dementia friends program. The um, the Alzheimer's Society are in the process of turning their dementia friends champions training into a dementia friends ambassadors program so they haven't they're busy re, they're busy upgrading champions to ambassadors at the moment so it might be new year before we can get some new ambassadors trained up but i think that's that that that's a good point councillor buckley thank you chair um it was a comment and a question actually the comment was that um um, having had some family experience of, of dementia, most people have nowadays, um, that uh, often social services say, well, we can help you more and we'll, we'll have three visits a day or whatever the figure is. And the last visit, typically, whatever, five, something like that, maybe six o'clock. And my experience is that that's not the problem um it is a problem because it's difficult to deal with at the best of times but the worst aspect of the problem is the night time when the dementia sufferer isn't aware that it's the night and getting up and so on and so forth so to me that seems to be a really intractable problem uh, but the question was um when we look at um, what you've said and, and the slides and so on um we can all do things to avoid um, the likelihood of getting dementia. And my question was, um, if you're genetically susceptible to dementia, if it's in your family, can you come to a crossroads where you get dementia or you don't get dementia? And if you've done everything that you should do and you live in an area with high air quality and all the rest, that you simply do not get it, full stop, or do you just get it later than you would have done otherwise? I don't know that I've got the sort of scientific and clinic, clinical basis to say that. I was, I was trained as a social worker before I, um, before I did this job. My, my understanding is that purely there are some there are some rare forms of of dementia that are sort of genetically determined, and, and they're usually they're usually younger onset, and and usually all the good behavior and, and all the good behavior in the world wouldn't um, save you from them. Um, I, I, I did some work with the with the um, Leeds Gypsy and Traveller Exchange, going back quite a few years because there's a particular travelling family um, who have this in 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 um, um, inherited type of dementia, and and all the fat and all the um, and the sons and daughters of this um, particular old 
older man who who well not that old actually in his in his 50s were getting tested to see if they had the gene or not um um one one thing they told me was that um people in, in traveling families people would misat misattribute the cause of the dementia to to bare knuckle fighting but actually the the person who had dementia had never had never done that his his brother had done it all his life and didn't have dementia so i think in in general the the main risk factors for dementia are our old age and bad luck um that lancet report estimated that maybe 30 percent of dementia if you could fix all those modifiable risk factors we could reduce the population prevalence by that much so we there are definitely opportunities there but but you can be unlucky you can live a blameless life and and and, and still get dementia and i think we tend to overestimate the genetic inheritance of it just because it's just because it is quite a prevalent condition once we get into our you know if, once we get to the age of 85 about one in five people have dementia so that's thankfully four in five of us don't but it's it's still common enough that you will get clusters of it in families without necessarily having a, a, a genetic link we sometimes overestimate those those genetic factors uh yeah the outside the alzheimer's society website that i linked to before is a really really good resource for that that kind of thing so i'll refer people to thank that. you tim mm. councillor cohen you had a question or a comment <laughs> oh dear 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 right councillor robinson did you have your hand up earlier no yeah okay all right and councillor richard kind of links from the um the fact that we are parished in the outer northeast so um we've had a mention of 13 villages in harewood we've got five villages one town and we've already mentioned um wise as a main contributor in this area and one of the ways that wise has been hugely successful of late certainly post covid is the fact that it has been going out to the villages and it could be my mind is thinking that what is normally seen as a little bit of a disadvantage you talk we talked about silos and individual areas but the strength of villages is that the community does tend to uh, support and engage and certainly uh, parishes i know have taken advantage of dementia friendly training and that's why we've got a lot of people who within our parish communities have got that so my question is would there be a real um benefit to actually see the parished areas smaller units be a positive way in which to engage with uh, communities to look at the issue of isolation, to look at the resourcing, to look at all those things and using those existing both communities and providers to actually do something really positive and proactive with this. Absolutely, yes, I think. And well, whether we're talking about the civil parishes or the faith based parishes, I think I think the answer is yes to to both of those things. Um, I, and, and you can have a dementia friendly community at, at absolutely any any level Le Leeds is accredited as a dementia friendly community but it doesn't really make sense as one community and it is only when you get to the local level that you can really talk about a, a dementia friendly community yeah. I mean even down to it further we know that the work that some of the churches do themselves within that so that we know that members of our community in the churches are being supported and we will all know who those members are but they are very functioning members of that smaller community and because they are in that smaller community they then can function in the wider area still so i just wonder though whether we need to formalize that and actually you know support the work that those third sector churches all those people do to actually help it happen All right, Tim, thank you. Um, Councillor Cohen, have you now remembered? I haven't, and I've written it down, so I didn't forget again. Um, 
Uh, it's actually built uh, on um, Councillor Stevenson's question or, or challenge as to uh, uh, why all our officers are, are not uh, tra dementia trained uh, and dementia friendly ambassadors, uh, and indeed Councillor Richards. Uh, and it, it just occurs to me that we have 99 councillors, all of whom are public facing by definition. Um, Listen, listening to today, uh, the training is but an hour. Um, and I would urge you to please speak to the uh, to, to governance. It should absolutely be part of the offer for members training uh, that every one of us uh, be a dementia friendly ambassador. And speaking as our group whip, I'm more than happy to require all of our members to do that and i don't and when i say i make, I make it sound like i'm cracking it, it wouldn't be necessary and i take a punt i don't think any i think every councillor would be delighted to spend an hour to improve their skill set in that regard i'm looking at councillor jenkins i don't expect you to speak on behalf of your whole group but i don't think i'm wrong when i'd say that you're sitting impassively maybe i am <laughs> thank you just as a matter of interest uh, wards and community committee colleagues, how many of you are actually dementia trained? So there's a fair few of us, and I can think Councillor Lamb is as well. So yeah, yeah. So, so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a difficult thing to actually enlarge that number across the council. I don't think. Thank you, Sam. You've got a final question. Thank you, Chair, uh, and I'll be quick. Uh, it, uh, the <laughs> A big issue for me has always been identifying carers across the whole of the city, because when I was a carer, I didn't want to admit it. Uh, so the question is, obviously, the biggest thing there, for example, I didn't know about carers leads until I was elected, uh, whether that was through my own personal butting out and forget it and not being interested, etc., or whether I actually didn't reach out. Could I ask more generally in terms of particularly the work that you're doing, what role is particularly carers leads and, and the role that they're playing within the strategy to ensure that across the board that people that are actually out there in the community are aware of the services that are available to them? Because unfortunately, it seems to me they do a fantastic job, but most of the groups seem to be city centre or centrally based. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly come back on the um, dementia friends, just just to clarify, um, to train as a dementia friends am ambassador will take um, will take a day and that equips you to then run a dementia friends session. So I think what we're looking at is um, a, as many councillors and as, and as many staff as possible to, to be dementia friends and the more people that can train up as which which takes an hour um the more people that can train up as what were champions and are now going to be called ambassadors um for that that day the the easy, easy that will be that will become and the idea of being an ambassador is that you're you're also a sort of visible point of contact you know up beyond beyond the one hour the um um the point about carers leads and visibility they they do run carer support groups out in the in in the towns and villages, so that um, there is one at Garforth and, 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 and one and one at Weatherby every month. There's a mix of generic groups and dementia carer support groups. So there there is um, and, and they are they are all on on the Carers Leads website. The main way in which they work to identify people who aren't known as carers, and it, and it is a huge problem, is um, is is through GP practices. So um, I I can't think of an of a um, Allwood Allwoodley um, or or Harewood example off the top of my head, but I know Carers Lees have a regular slot at um, Crossley Street Surgery at Weatherby, for example. Um, so I think it's 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 what they call the yellow card scheme that enables a GP practice to tell tell Carers Lees that someone's been identified as a carer. Um, the pictures. The picture's improving, but I think it's still the case that um, only about 15% of the of the count of carers out there are recorded on their GP practice systems as, as being carers. But that's the that's what but we are counting that now, which is the which is the main thing. We can 
we can track it from a low base and it'll and it and, and it will improve. I think on that point, and um, that the LCPs are actually trying to see what they can do to make sure that all GP practices are aware of that and that there's posters in the waiting rooms, etc. So certainly our LCP are looking at that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Um, it's it's a difficult subject to discuss and one that at least has prompted some ideas and some thoughts in uh, several of the councillors here this evening. So thank you very much. I'm conscious that the gentleman and the lady at the other end of the thing, I'm sure that that was probably linked with the work that you've been doing, but please feel free to leave. <laughs> So thank you very much to both Tims and uh, Joe and Councillor Jenkins. So item number 11 on the agenda is the local plan update, public consultation. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for having us. Um, it really is um, a sort of a final plug for the, the local plan update consultation that we're currently running. Uh, it's been running since the 24th of October. Uh, it's been running for 10 weeks. Uh, we're in our last week, so we're, we're really here to, to give that sort of final plug um, and, and get the communities to, to sort of participate in, in the consultation uh, and have a look at the, the information online. Um, just a sort of very brief introduction, the, the local plan update um, really is flowing from the city's climate emergency declaration that was made back in 2000, uh, 2019. Um, and we did a review of our planning policies and we determined that we should prioritise and update our local plan policies um, and sort of look at existing policies, look at where we can uh, implement and add new policies where we can look to address carbon reduction uh, in new development um, and to reduce the impacts on, on climate change locally. We undertook um, a consultation around the scoping of that local plan last summer, um, and we've been working up and now drafted a series of new and amended policies, um, which is what was out for consultation. So we really want to uh, impress upon sort of the, the, the stakeholders, the statutory quantities, the residents, the businesses of Leeds um, to, to sort of support the work that we're doing. Um, and if, if, if there are objections, the reasons for those. Um, as way as presentation, I'm going to share a video that we um, produced and is, is online just as a sort of an introductory. It, it's only four and a half minutes long. Um, so I'll, I'll just look to play that and then we could take questions and, and comments from that, if that's OK. City Council, we're inviting you to comment on the Leeds Local Plan Update Publication Draft. In this short introductory video, we'll explain what the consultation is about, what you can comment on and how you can comment. More detailed information is available on the Council's web pages at www.leeds.gov.uk forward slash LPU. Here you can view the documents and supporting evidence and also where you can find our online response survey. You may already have commented on our scoping consultation last summer in 2021 or you may be completely new to this and if so, you may have lots of questions. By visiting the Leeds Local Plan Update webpages, you can find out more. The Leeds Local Plan provides long-term planning policies that guide the amount and location of development and includes more detailed topic-specific policies that help guide how that development should be built. Back in March 2019, the Council declared a climate emergency with the ambition to work towards carbon neutrality by 2030. This decision was based on climate-related events occurring both globally and locally. To achieve these ambitions, big changes are necessary. This consultation sets out how planning policies can help to achieve this. Within the carbon reduction topic, draft new policies seek that new buildings are to be net zero carbon and highly energy efficient, and that they should measure carbon emissions across the whole life cycle of a building higher standards of sustainable construction are sought, and opportunities for renewable energy like solar and wind are identified, and better use of sustainable heating technology is sought. Within the flood risk topic, our draft policies seek to protect the floodplain from unsustainable development, 
and for developments to consider the risk of flood defences failing, as well as considering future climate change scenarios. Safe routes for access and escape in types of flooding to be provided, and all proposals are expected to make adequate space for water and increase the use of sustainable drainage systems. Within the green and blue infrastructure topic, our draft policies seek to protect, maintain, enhance and extend the network of natural and semi-natural areas. This includes parks, woodlands and river corridors. Great protection for trees and increasing tree replacement numbers, alongside clear requirements for the delivery of high quality green space, support for community food growing and requiring developments to provide a biodiversity net gain of 10%. Within the placemaking topic, our draft policies introduce the concept of living locally, or you may have heard the phrase 20 minute neighbourhoods. This recognises the importance of walking to local amenities and facilities. There is stronger and clearer guidance on high quality design that should be delivered as part of new development, ensuring healthier environments are created for the completion of a health impact assessment for larger developments and that new policy resisting drive-through development due to its impact on air quality is introduced. Within the sustainable infrastructure topic, our draft policies support a new mass transit network and new railway infrastructure in Leeds, as well as development of Leeds station so that it has room for increased levels of passengers and services. A new policy requires high-speed internet for new developments. We need your views on whether our draft local plan update policies are the right ones. You may wish to comment on whether the policies are justified by evidence, whether they are realistic and effective, and whether they will deliver sustainable development. You can support what we're trying to achieve, or if you disagree to any of the policies, you will need to provide reasons and or evidence to support this. Due to the technical nature of this consultation, there are further guidance notes and summary versions of the consultation material available online at www.beads.gov.uk forward slash LPU or you can email us at lpu at leads.gov.uk You have until the 19th of December to have your say. So thank you very much. Um, that was a little four and a half minute video that was online. Um, we also ran a series of webinars on each of the topics. Um, they're also uploaded to YouTube and available online. Um, so I'm not going to run through the individual topics now. I think they're, they're too technical, uh, <laughs> but um, really is that just that last plug uh, to, to get people engaged and, and to, to have their say. So I'll take any comments or questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. I think the, the idea of showing the video on this is that people who, who are watching at home would actually be able to see that. And also if it's on YouTube, if they upload it afterwards, they also get that information. So it's another way of getting that message out, although they haven't got very long now if it's the 19th of December. So are there any questions from members, up, uh, presumably from the Environmental Committee? So uh, Councillor Buckley. And then Councillor Stevens. Not necessarily from the angle that you expect. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I was going to ask you, uh, firstly, uh, and can I ask this then in the form of a supplementary, we hear a lot about 20-minute neighbourhoods and 15-minute neighbourhoods. What's the difference? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm sure, yeah, it, it's not a, a unique question. Um, the concept of 20 minute neighborhoods actually started with the premise of a 15 minute city. Um, and this was back in 2016 by a, a, a Colombian scientist uh, called Marino, Carlos Marino, um, really looked at that um, interplay of space and availability of connections um, and looking at the sort of the inter interrelationship between leaving your house and, and being able to access your uh, requirements from your home within 15 minutes. Um, this concept is, is widely um, sort of uh, gaining traction across the world. Uh, it's being recognized with sort of a number of C40 cities in terms of the environmental benefit of 20 minute neighborhoods in terms of reducing that sort of the shortest uh, car journey trip. Um, so it's making sort of that living locally um, relationship. The Melbourne Australia plan, uh, Australia 
uh, sorry, plan Melbourne, um, change that definition to 20 minute neighborhoods. And that's that's the concept that the Town and Country Planning Association provide guidance on and produced a guide last year. And, and that's the concept that, that we're um, utilizing within our own policy. What I would say on the 20 minute neighborhood is not to become fixated by 20 minutes, the 10 minute walk out and the 10 minute walk back. It's there as a guide. Um, it really is about that premise of living locally. Come back, Chair. Uh, so my point really was this, that in the press over the last few days, we've heard about uh, Oxford, I think it is, who are in the process, uh, I think it's Oxford, it is. in the process of imposing a 15-minute neighbourhood system. And they're dividing the city up into six areas. And the idea is not that you would be able to exist and work and play and shop within your area, but that you will not leave. You will not be able, so I'm led to believe, to cross between the neighborhoods in a linear way in a car. The only way you will be allowed on threat of fine to do that is to go out to the ring road, along the ring road and back in. To, through another gate and there will be physical gates yeah. and yes and I would just put my point that this is authoritarianism and uh, it, it won't work uh, I'd like to uh, reassure that we're not Oxford um, we're, we're not looking at banning the automobile um, we do closely uh, as planners try and reflect and respond to the uh, transport strategy connecting leads um, and one of their visions uh, and objectives is that people have the choice of access um, to travel by active means and by public transport and that they don't need a car to travel around Leeds but there is recognition that some people do need access to a car. What we're looking at in terms of our policy for 20 minute neighbourhoods is that living locally principle um, and we've worked very closely with um, consultants, Mark McDonald's, who've done some uh, geographical spatial analysis of the city in terms of walkable accessibility. Um, and that enables us to, at a local level, apply a score um, of how sustainable a windfall development is. So this, uh, this, this policy would only apply to, to sort of windfall developments coming forward. Um, and it enables us to look at the, the walkability of those sort of essential services and facilities that you'd expect to find uh, within your local area. We recognize that there are limitations to that. And what we asked uh, Mark McDonald's to do in that work is to recognize that it isn't a one fit all approach um, it works very well within the urban areas, um, although the mapping does demonstrate that there are parts of the urban area that you'd expect to be um, sustainable, actually aren't, because there's there's deserts um, of, of th there's no, no supplies or sort of community facilities or there's lacks. Um, so there's an opportunity there to, to actually address that through the policy um, by if a new development comes forward, we can address, um, identify where there might be a gap in a facility. Um, and, and help to address that through, through the requirements. Now, clearly windfall developments, they're not necessarily large, so there are difficulties in that. Um, we've also got to recognise that there are difficulties in terms of um, working in partnership, um, certainly with, I'll give the example of children's services, provision of primary schools, um, and the key one that's been mentioned here in terms of access to GPs. Um, which is an issue. And I think for, for the outer north uh, east area, it's that recognition of geography, um, and the interrelationship between villages. You, you've already sort of discussed that earlier this evening um, and that, that role. There's an opportunity to sort of look at the, the role of places and villages as, as clusters. Um, but yeah, um, I think that answers your question. We're, we're not trying to be authoritarian in, in determining what a 20 minute neighborhood is. Well, actually, it is authoritarian because one of the phrases that you used there was um, that walking and uh, cycling would be freely available wherever you wanted to go. And then you, you actually said 
Um, and of course, there are some people who need access by car. Really? We're all free subjects, aren't we? Or we, we have been. Who decides who needs a car? And if that's not authoritarian, I don't know what is. And my final comment on this is um, if an area is designated here and then an area next to it, and each area is, let's just say, a similar size, and Tesco exists in area A, but is not in area B, so you can't drive from area A to area B to go to Tesco, that means that the other area cannot support another similar supermarket by definition, because uh, one can only be supported by the double community or beyond, even beyond that. So that by definition means that the prices paid by the average person are higher. So this is going to cost poor people money. Can I just step in there, Councillor Bucket? I don't think any of that is actually within Catherine's remit, to be fair. I think it's a it's an argument, and with the discussions that you've you've heard in the press, yes, it's a point to make, but I don't actually think that Catherine would be able to answer that here just now. Thank you. Um Councillor Stevenson and then Councillor Cohen. I thank you. I'm sure Catherine yes. will take Councillor Bucky's comments back to the Politburo though when we discuss it. So uh I agree a bit, <clears throat> a bit lighter. Um, on the Children and Family Scrutiny Board, um, uh, about a year ago, I think it was, we had a, a briefing on the local plan. And the, the Scrutiny Board spent an awful lot of time discussing uh, the uh, youth voice, I think is the phrase that was used. And um, the Scrutiny Board made a formal recommendation, I think, that actually is part of your consultation um, there should be an active effort to engage with schools and young communities, etc. So um, as the children's champion from this committee, can I ask um, what uh, engagement you have done with schools directly uh, and what was the outcome of that? Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Really recognise that that question. Um, yeah, we've we've done um, a similar sort of webinar presentation with uh, the, the Youth Voice, um, Youth Council, sorry. Um, it is difficult to, to get children engaged. Uh, we've done a particular sort of child friendly version of the consultation. Um, we've had limited, I have to say, response back. Um, but the, the sort of in, in public uh, events that, that that myself and Anna have attended, um, we have managed to get some some children to, to fill them in. Um, there was a little bit of a bribe. I have to say, in terms of a sort of uh, an opportunity to to win a five pound voucher and what the five pound voucher was for. Um, but the questions were more friendly um, worded um, in terms of setting out the objectives for each of the topic areas uh, and the policies and asking a much more simplified sort of question around whether they um, approved or in, in that. Um, personally, I have shared that with my um, sons and daughters primary school. Um, they have uh, an eco warrior team as part of their uh, primary school and they have taken that really sort of strongly and welcomely um, and are, are taking that back. Um, we've actually got a, a young member of staff that's joined us who used to attend Garforth Academy. They're doing a presentation, albeit this week, um, it is sort of late in the day in terms of the, the consultation period. We'll try and get as many of those questionnaires filled in at that event uh, this week, but it's really good that we've got a young planner in place who's taking it back to his local community and local school. Um, I think there's, there's two sort of really positive uh, angles there um, but yeah I really take on board that it, it's quite hard at particularly at this stage where it's really technical um, to get the young people engaged but we, we've tried. Uh, a quick comment I think one of the areas as well that we tend to miss is uh, the, the trying to grab that primary school age is it's it's laudable to to have them interested although uh, although sometimes it feels like um uh, our plans are drawn up uh, occasionally uh, by, but uh, the point I was going to make is it's, it's I'm actually thinking more around 
uh, college age as well, because actually these are the people who will be affected and need to know what the infrastructure is going to be, how they're accessing jobs, what the developments are looking like and services around them. Um, so I think that that age gap is probably where it's a comment you'd have to come back on. Can I come to Councillor Richards, please? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, lots again in the presentation and lots of really good proposals, whether that be about, you know, solar panels or sewage, favourite topic of mine. Um, my question would be, so we've got all these, um, how will they or can they impact on those developments which are already either in place or forward in their planning? So I think about, say, the Weatherby, yes, the weather, a huge development, huge impact on everything. And will that mean that they can still carry on in what it was? Or is there an opportunity to actually, even at this stage, say, this is a better way that it might happen, even with some of the actual physical infrastructure? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, as policy making, it does take time, unfortunately. Um, as we get through the consultation, subject to the level of objections that we receive, um, we can apply at what's called planning weight to the considerations of the draft policies. They are draft at this stage and they still need to be submitted to the planning inspector and go through examination. Um, they have to go through various tests to, to be found sound and then adopted. Once they're adopted, they carry full weight in the determination of any planning application. Prior to that, though, um, as I say, through through the process, through the planning process, they gain that material weight. So subject to these um, uh, policies, draft policies, um, not receiving significant objections, um, then they can carry limited material weight in the determination. There's definitely things that we can utilize in terms of the ambitions, um, the links with um, the climate change emergency and um, the, the other strategies which we're moving to, um, but they are draft policies um, and it is subject to the sort of the, the consultation responses that we get, um, that they will gain weight as they move through. So it's very much a sort of, sort of status play in terms of when, when developments come in, I'm afraid. Councillor Cohen. Thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose with particular thought to policies around 20 minute neighbourhoods, but with policies like this in general, we have a whole raft of planning policies at the moment <clears throat> that uh, officers in their decision-making capacity uh, and attend, and and when it comes to it, members at panel uh, are asked to give varying degrees of weight to. But as a member that sits on plans panel, uh, and this is something that councillors across the spectrum say, uh, all too often, and I, I'll give an example, uh, for example, bedroom mix, where we have a policy around bedroom mix um, and officers instruct councillors, and I'm putting it slightly stronger, but in reality, that's what it is, that even though something is far from policy compliant, we still have to approve it. Or we could look at accessibility, where we have an accessibility policy. And I can think of developments both in Ardsley and Robin Hood. And as far as this uh, area, community committee is concerned in Weatherby, horse, horse, uh, race, the horse race course, race course, yeah, race course approach, a classic example, where it failed on innumerable accessibility criteria contrary to policy, and yet officers say has to be approved. My question is, what's the point of spending hours and hours debating, agreeing, consulting on policies that the council's own officers are going to then say, well, when it comes to it, a pragmatic approach is necessary. And it doesn't matter if it's 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, or an hour and 20 minute communities. Uh, you just got to ignore it and grant things that have no business being granted. 
why are we going through these shenanigans when ultimately they're going to be ignored? I mean, the book, this is, this consultation here is about the local plan update one climate change. What you're talking about is the development management process of when an application comes in and how we take a balanced judgment across all the policies we've got, plus the national planning policy framework. I'm not teaching anyone here anything that they don't know. What I will say, though, is that yeah sometimes it's not going to work it's not going to work the way everyone wants it to work that's what taking a balanced approach is we're doing these policies to mitigate climate change that's our purpose climate change is real it's happening we want to mitigate it as much as possible i don't recognize the idea that we shouldn't do anything so we're doing something and the something is creating a new set of policies that new planning applications can be judged against for instance this one here en1 says that uh, they're um, allowed to they have to be, what's the phrasing that Dan uses, whole life cycle carbon emissions of development have to be net zero. That means anyone putting in a new building will have to show us in evidence, passed by our energy officer, how that building from beginning to end will, through its whole life, create no extra carbon for the atmosphere and mitigate climate change. It might not be perfect every time, councillor, but I do believe in the long run, we will get quite a considerable benefit and that will help. And all our policies are like that. They're not going to work perfectly every time. Nothing does. But I do believe it will mitigate climate change in the long run. And that's the purpose of this consultation. Thank, thanks. I don't disagree with you, by the way. Uh, and I, <laughs> I suppose what I'm voicing is the frustration at the, at the business end, as it were. A uh, qu question. Uh, I'm right in saying, aren't I, that compliance with these additional policies would come at a cost to developers that will have a follow-up. Absolutely, and that's factored in. We, as part of this whole policy framework, we have to do a viability assessment that's ordered by the government. And we have to make sure that our policies on the whole are viable and can stand up. So yes, it's going to come as a cost, but you know, that's that's something we factor in. And the development industry as part of this process will almost assuredly come back and say, ah, it's going to cost all too much. And we're fully expecting that by the end of the week. So they will have their ability to say and present their evidence at, um, at, at you know, the appropriate time at the examination in public. But yes, of course, it will. There are things here that are going to cost so much. I don't know if Kat's right. Uh, it, it's important we note that because, of course, uh, again, colleagues that sit on plans panels particularly, will be aware that viability is fundamental. And actually, if we're putting extra costs on at this end, that means it's materially reducing the available profit, which means the ability for developers to contribute to affordable housing and other community uh, infrastructure projects is diminished by equal amount. I just think, I think we've got to, it is actually a zero sum game. Uh, there is an input cost, there is an output, and there is an allowable profit. And if we're adding a cost on, all we're doing is actually, we're literally robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, and I don't dispute it may be, um, and is for a good reason in terms of environmental protection. But I think it's important we are alive to the fact that this means the ability to deliver community infrastructure and affordable housing are going to be definitively impacted. It can't be otherwise. Well, that was a comment. Thank you, Catherine. All right. Uh, Councillor Robinson, did you have a question? I did, yeah. Some comments and then some questions, if that's okay, Chair. Um, so 20-minute neighbourhoods. And my concern always with them is that if you take an area like ours, um, that people say, well, we'd love you to have 20-minute neighbourhoods, and the way to deliver it is more housing. That's how you need. That's how you're going to be able to make sure you have a 20 minute neighbourhood. Because at the moment, if you measured many of the villages in our area, I'm looking at colleagues, you wouldn't say they were 20 minute neighbourhoods. Um, but delivering 2,000 houses is not necessarily going to be the way to make them 20 minute neighbourhoods either. In fact, there's a whole range of other problems that you will bring with them that would kibosh 20 minute neighbourhoods. Um, 
you also mentioned about access to um, high speed internet as part of this. Presumably, all new developments will have the access to IoT as part of it, and um, that will be built into the services that are being delivered. Um, and waterways were mentioned by Councillor Richards. Given that our waterways run across different boundaries, how is this plan going to be aligned with an area, say, like Bradford, where waterways would run from and into Leeds as well? And I, I think there might be a follow up as well, Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I note the concern around the 20 minute neighbourhoods and perhaps won't answer that one. <laughs> um, other today than to say that this policy in this local plan update focuses on windfall developments. It's not looking at or reassessing the site allocations plan. Um, I can come back to this group and talk about local plan update two, which will probably re rename, rebrand, because it's, it's going to get confusing. Um, certainly high speed um, internet, um, um, excuse my ignorance, but I don't actually know what IoT stands for. So that's uh, Internet of Things. That's where you would have your street lights that are connected up as part of that. It's where you, you know, the data sharing that would enable you to have service improvement. Yeah, I, I can't see why we, we shouldn't be asking developers for that uh, as part of that infrastructure. Um, waterways, um, we've undertaken um, uh, new evidence uh, and update in terms of our strategic flood risk assessment and that maps and measures um, the all the waterways um, so that our main rivers um, and the culverts uh, and the catchment of that. So whilst that base is based on Leeds district and it's updating um, that evidence base around the flood alleviation work that's that's happened in the city centre um, and further along the River Air. Um, it, it does take into consideration the impacts of upstream and downstream. Uh, we have a duty to cooperate um, partnership with uh, adjoining local authorities to which those rivers catchments run. So it's it's all sort of factored into the modelling, um, but we the policies as they apply apply to to leads um, they are very much factored on protecting our flood plains um, and making sure that any development follows that sequential approach to, to flood risk and that there is no um, risk further downstream so we're not creating problems to other local authorities and our adjacent local authorities will have similar policies in place as well just to i guess follow up on that I, that's going to mean that authorities around us are going to have to have the same exacting and high standards as we are um and presumably they are being consulted on this plan and their comments will be coming back and vice versa will happen but if any development was happening i'm, I'm going to pick on bradford again and it's not because i'm picking on bradford it's because i think of the river wharf and where it runs from and to um any impact that happens further upstream in invariably it's going to have an impact downstream on us and it would be the same case for us if we were thinking about what goes into north yorkshire as well so um taking that argument um to a previous question from i think councillor cohen you made a point about the whole life cycle of a development would need to have net zero if i take a hypothetical example and let's say a planning application came in for an airport that was coming forward um how would you be able to measure that or a mass transit system over its life cycle, over technological changes that would come forward, over the sheer volume of concrete that would be needed to deliver a mass transit system, over the diversion of traffic that would be required and the extension of people's journeys. And on that basis, would applications for something like an airport be refused? This hypothetical airport. <laughs> uh, I don't want to go too far into this. You're absolutely right. There has to be a limit to where we can measure. If a lot of the policies, like the one that we're talking about, will be applied to residential and commercial developments, and there will be a limit, usually it's a red line boundary. They will ask for impact. We will ask for other things. The ongoing effects of, i.e., 
you know, things go outside, things come in, and that's going to have a knock-on effect. And which power source do you use? Do you gas-powered fault or, you know, other types of power station? You're going to get a lot of that. But there will be limitations. We have recently employed in last year an energy officer who is an expert in all these considerations. She's now assessing all the applications against this criteria. I would love to say I am worldly wise and be able to start, give you all the technicals in and out. In and out. But um, she seems to understand all the energy questions that you're asking. If you wish after this meeting, I can give you her name and you can talk it through with her. But I will urge you to read through because it's, we've got quite a lot of written text supporting the policies. And if you had any questions then afterwards, please contact myself or I can put you in touch with this officer or the appropriate officer if can give you a more comprehensive answer. But I'm afraid I can't technically answer that at this meeting. And, and, and neither would I expect you to ask others in many ways. But I think the point's well made that with changes in transport systems we know that mass transit is going to be coming forward that is going to have a short-term impact on us but potentially a longer-term impact in terms of air travel we know that they're already looking at electric flights that can be possible and actually advancements in technologies there energy efficiency that's coming forward i would hate to think that anybody would try and use the climate emergency to tr stop some developments that would be beneficial to the wider impact and the wider needs of um, of communities the final question I'd asked him, and it is a question, then I will shut up. Um, in the recommendations um, and some of the com comments that have come forward from this group, I know we in the past we've talked about a 20 for one policy on trees. So now I think it's been a three to one policy in the past. Um, that um, How are we going about beefing that up and beefing up the powers around TPOs as well? I think many times tree protection orders have been um, limited in the fines that we've issued. And uh, as a deterrent for people, it's been easy for them to chop down a tree and just say, well, we'll take the fine after. Uh, well, quite frankly, that, that can't continue. Has that been addressed in this? Okay, well, first of all, we'll do the bit on the tree replacement. The, the old tree replacement was land two, and it was at three to one. It was wholly inadequate. Um, what we've done now is we've, um, and again, I urge you to read it, we've put it on what's called a carbon sequestration footing. I don't want to get too technical, but very, very quickly, Carbon mitigation, forest trees provide an amazing form of a carbon sink, if you like. They, For want of a better phrase, they suck carbon out of the atmosphere through, um, and we're trying to improve that. So rather than measure a tree of that tree equals that tree, the first thing is how much carbon sequestration work do they do? And then when they say we have to chop down this tree, because first and foremost, we've beefed up the idea that trees are on site and they're staying on site. When they do get around to saying we're going to chop down that tree, we'll say, well, that tree did a work of X in carbon sequestration. We have now got research from the University of um, Leeds, along with um, another society name escapes me, who've provided tables for us where we can actually at reasonably well measure what you would need to replace that tree with that tree. So if you chop down a 300-year-old oak and it's doing work X, you might have to provide 25 of this type of tree to mitigate that. In other words, to equalize it. And the wording is, it should be no less. So even at the starting point, then 25 trees will be doing the same work as that will mature oak. But then after that, as they get older, it'll improve. So that's our starting point. So that's our question to that one, the replacement. We are, we're really quite, well, I'm quite proud of it. Um, I, you know, the GBI bit, we, I think it's a really good policy. I hope we, we get it to the examination. The other question you ask about TPOs is an ongoing one that we've always had problems with. The legislation is not helpful to us here. And as you quite rightly say, we, we've had reports, I mean, some of our landscapes tell us horrifying stories where they just, you know, they don't even do it. You say they chop them down, take the fine. Some of them poison the trees and then they decay. So we're well aware of that. I can, I've not heard of anything yet that we can do under that particular legislation that can improve that. I think there are some process changes coming in with regards to more officers who can respond much quickly, more quickly. I do know from a personal level that someone phoned me up the other day and said they phoned up on a Thursday and by the Saturday a TPO was on that tree. So, you know, it, it was a big tree. So our processes are improving. I'm not sure there's much legislation, unless you can help me out, Kurt, here. Well, <laughs> yeah. 
Maybe not on the legislation, but I think we've strengthened the policy. So the, the, the relevant policy uh, is policy G2A, protection of trees and woodland. And it's very specific in there that when we're assessing the loss of trees, it includes the loss of trees that might have been on site prior to developer coming on. So often we're faced with developers coming on and said, oh, we've got a clear site. Isn't this great? We can fill it with development. And we go, hmm, OK. Um, Actually, this policy is much strengthener, uh, much stronger because we can go back in time. We can look at what was on the, the site and we can essentially find them in terms of biodiversity credits um, and, and the, the cost of the tree replacement. Yeah. Um, it's not going to be as good as the tree that was there. Um, and so that's linked with our new um, policies around um, design. And that real strength of asking developers to do the assessment of the character and value of the assets that are on site. So not only sort of the historic character, but the landscape character is essential. And work with what they've got uh, and work in the trees and the hedgerows. Um, it, it does link um, with some um, regulations that are in the policy in terms of hedgerows as well. So we're not just talking about trees, we're talking about hedgerows. So I think we've, we've really sort of tried to to pump up that uh, policy in terms of trees. Yeah, in importantly, please go and have a flick through if nothing else and comment on it and any support will be very much appreciated. Right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that you had to wait so long to actually get to your part on the agenda, but appreciate the fact that you did stay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. OK, uh, the next agenda item is the Community Committee Update Report and Finance, which Preet is going to quickly allude to. Thanks, Chair. Um, I am going to take the update uh, report and the finance report together. Um, firstly, in, ter in terms of the update report, I just want to bring members' attention to paragraph 3 to 42, and um, that's some of the main headlines that have been happening in the ward. Um, there's been a lot of stuff happening bearing in mind it's only been six to seven weeks since the last community committee. Um, I will invite the councillors if they want to um, highlight or say anything that's taken place in the ward. Um, but one of the things that I would like to mention is the youth, youth consultation survey. Um, I know a lot of the councillors are governors, um, so if they could just give that a push to their schools, that'd be really, really helpful. Um, and I will now open it to the councillors if they want to raise anything or if they have any questions in regards to the report. Thank you. Councillor Buckley. Sorry, it, it was just the update report. I wanted a very quick question on which Preet can probably send me in an email. The reference to lighting, things like lights on trees and that kind of thing. Um, and the question is, which officer should I email about problems with this? Is this in regards to festive lights? Yes. Um, yeah, I'll send you the details. Yeah, thank, thank you. Councillor Stevens. Just by way of very quick feedback, um, I hear Santa visited or Woodley recently, and um, it was it received very great feedback uh, from local residents. And I just think it's a is an ex a perfect example of where councillors are proactive in their area. And I think in the Harewood Ward, that's perhaps something we might want to talk about. Uh, with our colleagues to see if it's something we can maybe replicate um, further to keep Councillor Firth busy. Take it, you're you're volunteered then, Sam. Yeah, look at you. Uh, well, yeah, I would also I would actually like to say that on the on the front of Christmas lights and bonfires that we were very happy, and and certainly Councillor Richards had to go and take a phone call, but she um, she visited all of the bonfires that were in our ward uh, because we had actually helped them with some some funding to um, for various things for advertising etc and so she did visit many 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 bonfires and enjoyed it and the fireworks were lovely and again uh, we're, we'll be attending most of the light switch ons and it's weatherby's tomorrow night so go on. 
thank thank you chair it's interesting you mentioned councillor richards because uh it's interesting uh some uh local residents actually informed me that they've never seen a councillor get around so many bonfires uh so somebody, it's amazing how she managed to be more than one place at once so clearly councillor richard has some magical powers so uh uh, just like just like Sansa, who I'm sure would be delighted uh, to visit both Harewood and Weatherby were he invited. Yeah. Councillor Robinson. Thanks, Chair. Um, CCTV is mentioned in the report on CCTV operations. Could I request that we have uh, an officer representative come to a future meeting and discuss this further with us? Because requests have gone in for information and they've yet to be received back. So that would be useful. Thank you. Do you want this in the ward members or? No, they can come here. Yeah, that's I fine. I'll get that yeah. yeah, thank you. Any other comments on the uh, the update report? I've... No? Okay, thank you. Finance, please. Thanks, Chair. Moving on to finance, I only have two funding application applications, both are for Harewood Ward. The first one is for wellbeing for the Thorn at over 60s drop in. Is this to be approved? Yeah, excellent. Thank just you. Just so we're clear, Kate, this chair, it's the drop in. We're not dropping over 60s. <laughs> and the second one is also for Harewood, and it is paragraph 26. It's the Junior Indoor Club, Barrick and Elmi Cricket Club. Yeah. Super. Thank you. I would just like to mention that we did receive two items of correspondence from um, residents. One was about care home planning consultations from a resident in Bramham, and the other was about the Station Road Bridge in Skulls um, from a, a gentleman. Um, those emails have been passed on to the relevant departments for responses but i think that i would suggest that maybe particularly the the station road bridge skulls one is something that maybe ward councillors might like to talk to the individual about themselves or possibly the parish council but that he will get a response from the relevant department okay thank you so so the the date and time of the next meeting is Monday, the 13th of March, 2023, at 5 at 5.30 p.m. But we just need, to, yeah, smart, stop it. Yeah, and the venue is to be, the venue is to be confirmed. Any of the ward members who have got an idea for a venue that we could utilise, which allows us to stream, the, the meeting then please let please let preet know thank you very much okay that concludes business for today's meeting safe journey home season's greetings and a very happy new year thank you <laughs>